Hi, it's Barrington Miller from the Canadian Securities Exchange, and welcome to another edition of Hashtag Finance. Today, I'm here with Cresco Labs, and for the first time, we have two people being interviewed. Uh, Charles Bactel, the CEO, and Joe Caltabiano, uh, the president. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Barrington. Great Thanks, to Barrington. be here. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about Cresco, and normally what I ask people is, why did you choose the name Cresco? How did it come about? Cresco, one of the larger uh, U.S. multi-state operators, um, became publicly traded on the uh, Canadian Securities Exchange back in December of uh, 18. Uh, 11 state footprint, vertically integrated operations, as I think you you, you need to be, you better be, uh, if you want to be a top three player in the U.S. space at this time, um, but with a primary focus on the, the sort of middle two verticals of the value chain, which is the creation of branded products and distribution of branded products. So the name Cresco came from to grow in Latin. Uh, it was actually when Charlie and I and, and our other two partners, Rob and Dom, started looking at the space, we were on a flight out to Colorado to learn a little bit more and visit some grows and, and understand, and on the way there or back, I think back. we were... Uh, search in the internet for the names and and came across uh, Cresco so our, our partner Dom gets credit for the name I don't think we uh, we give him too much uh, credit for that but uh, yeah no it's a it's a it's a great name and uh, your approach to the, the industry is seems uh, extremely calculated and extremely uh, professional and direct in a, in a good way um, it looks like you guys are trying to normalize the industry and you've taken it seems your past life in the mortgage space and and applied some lessons learned. Could you uh, expand on that a little bit? Yeah, we both come from uh, regulated mortgage banking. Uh, it started out in the mortgage industry. It wasn't as regulated as maybe it should have been. And when your industry is is part of the economic collapse, regulation comes flying at you from everywhere. Uh, the company that myself, Charlie, and other partner Rob worked at, um, we were in that industry pre-collapse, during collapse, and post-collapse. And, and we realized that by navigating navigating regulation better. We were able to help grow a company, scale a company, and use regulation as a competitive advantage. So when Illinois launched its medical program, it really felt um, something similar to what we were used to from an audit standpoint, from uh, being transparent with regulators. So we were able to navigate that industry in, in the state of Illinois very early on, and, and I think it helped us form the company that you see in front of you. Um, tell us a little bit about some of the products that are available. And uh, I was listening to your talk yesterday at the GMP event, and you have different lines for different experiences and different points of entry uh, in the cannabis space for the end user. Um, could you expand on that just a little? Sure. You know, so for us, um even as an organization, one of our core values is know your audience. And so when you're talking about products, your audience for a product is the consumer base, the customer. <clears throat> and um, you know, when we won our first licenses for the first nine months, uh, we weren't a cannabis company, we were a construction company, you know, building three facilities and, and, uh, and, and planting our first crops and harvests. And so we, we, we spent that time um, developing the brand, developing the message, and you know we were fortunate coming online in a in a highly regulated, compliance-focused medical market east of the Mississippi. It made us um, acknowledge the fact that there was likely going to be more than one market segment um, that would participate in the program, and that you couldn't just have you know kind of cannabis by cannabis people for cannabis people approach to this. Mm -hmm. You were going to have your traditional cannabis customer, which is always going to be part of any program, but you were definitely going to have your non-traditional cannabis customer who has never tried, never thought they would try cannabis in their life, but their oncologist told them it'll help with the nausea from chemo. Um, that same person is going to be walking into the same store as the traditional cannabis customer, and they're effectively buying the same product. They just want it to look and feel very differently than the other. The traditional cannabis customer doesn't want to buy anything that looks like Pfizer made it, um, while the new uh, non-traditional cannabis customer doesn't want to buy anything that sort of plays to the, to the stereotypes of the traditional or, or uh, preconceived uh, um, uh, sort of uh, stigma of cannabis. So for us, it was very important to create brands that spoke to each one of those market segments uh, directly and appropriately. And that's in form and that's also in, in look and feel, so packaging and branding. There's, uh, <clears throat> there were a few people that we've spoken to uh, in the last little bit that was either emphasizing get your brand out or get your distribution channel set. Which one 
would you fall into or which one do you believe um, if I was to start a cannabis company what would you do first I think they're one and the same I think getting your brand in front of people you utilize your own distribution channel to do that so you know you when we look at the cannabis industry there's four verticals there's the cultivation manufacturing side there's the development of branded products there's the distribution of branded products and then there's brick and mortar retail Cresco is built in the two middle ones we really focus on the development of those brands but then you need to make sure you have market penetration with those brands and controlling your own destiny nobody will represent your brand better than yourself so it's it's great to have a phenomenal brand and a great brand story but if that brand doesn't get on the shelves of other people's stores you could have the best brand in the world but it's not being seen by the consumer so I think it's it's really important you can't really choose one and that's why our focus and, and recent acquisitions like Origin House dovetail very nicely into that of focusing on brands focusing on the development of brands and then making sure that product is on everybody's shelf who will let you in that door uh, during your talk yesterday, <clears throat> just uh, continuing with the brand uh, branding, you mentioned I think it was Johnny Walker, Johnny Walker Blue or something like that for the uh, the very high end, um, and it seems that one of the things I've learned by interviewing a lot of these companies is they are borrowing from uh, the different sectors, borrowing from different places uh, that traditionally worked and now applying it to to the cannabis industry. So um, it, it seems to be working. And uh, yeah. 700, 700 stores, 700 plus stores, yeah. I think your products are in. Um, how did you, how do you do that? How does... <laughs> so you do it a couple of different ways, right? You you have to have a big geographic footprint. Um, you you have to you have to be in the states um, that uh, that are important that matter. You have to have a nice broad um, availability to deploy your products into different markets. So you know we were, we're in eleven states now. Um, that was a big goal of ours to make sure that we had a nice geographic footprint that we expanded um, very strategically. Those are states that have big. Um, populations associated with them too. Seven of the ten most populated states in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, the only three that we're missing don't have uh, cannabis programs. So, you know, it's it's intentional. Uh, it's by design. And then you also you've got to figure out distribution in California. And again, that's sort of where that origin house. Um, acquisition comes into play. Um, going back to the brand component of it too, the other way that you get distribution into that many stores is you do, you know, for us at least, it was that house of brands approach. It was, it was creating something that could speak to the majority of the market segments, the customer bases that would be coming into any of these stores around the country, whether it was a very medicinally focused customer or patient to a wellness and lifestyle category to, as you mentioned, the reserve uh, brand, which is, you know, and a nod to a Johnny Walker Blue label for that uh, for the connoisseur um, customer segment. So it's it's having the products available for whatever consumer or customer walks through that door. That's how you get a big uh, distribution footprint. Also, well, you definitely used a big foot to kick in the California door. Let's talk a bit about the Origin House. Um, One point one billion. Um, why Origin House? How did who asked who to the dance first? What? Uh, tell us a little bit about that because the beginning of April was. Uh, the industry was kind of shaken in a really good way um, by that announcement. Yeah, so we met Mark Lustig um, when we were up in Toronto pre-going public. Uh, Mark became a friend, a trusted advisor. Um, you know, Origin House, formerly Canna Royalty, uh, was one of the first, if not the first, cannabis company listed on the CSE that focused on the U.S. Yeah. Uh, so Mark is a pioneer in the space and, and built a company that went deep into the world's largest cannabis market, and that's California. So, you know, getting to know Mark over time, um, we we enjoyed talking to him. We had a very similar view on the market of, of developing brands and distributing those brands into the market. Our view was a little broader. We went deep in states like Illinois, Pennsylvania, Ohio, some of the other markets we operate in, and Mark focused on one single state and really went deep into that California market. So, um, you know, as businesses develop, as as we have uh, expectations of becoming um, the, the world's largest cannabis company someday, uh, you start look at strategic 
uh, M&A transactions that are dynamic and that change the industry, not just planting a flag in some state to say that, that you've got one more state under your belt, but looking at channels such as distribution. And we've talked about developing brands, we've talked about distribution, but, but really focusing on executing on an M&A transaction that shows the world that we're serious about it and improving the company that we are. It's bringing on talent from that team. It's bringing on people who know distribution in a much more material way than a couple guys who came from the mortgage banking industry. It's people who understand that California market, which is the most authentic cannabis market and, and one of the most difficult ones to navigate. It made Cresco a better company. You know, the, the thing I would add is at the at the very kind of superficial optic level, it's great, right? It's the largest distributor and the largest <coughs> cannabis market in the world. Right. Um, but many of the things that Joe mentioned are that sort of next level, the talent, the experience, Mark's capital markets background um, up here in Canada. Um, it's the fact that that distribution model was, was built and created by a former executive from Southern Wine and Spirits, you know, one mm -hmm. of the largest, if not the largest, liquor and beer distributor in the U.S. So the fundamentals that are there, the foundation, that's there, the technology that's behind it, um, it does, it, it makes our platform better across the country and the other markets that we're in that we're doing our own distribution. It also, you know, again, focusing on that brand play for us, we love the idea, you know, we don't have to create all of our own brands. Um, we want to fill our house of brands with the brands that resonate most with consumers, whether we created it or not. So being uh, uh, the largest distributor in California is going to give us a wonderful opportunity to work with some really, you know, incredible new creative brands that develop in California, and we can, we can provide them an opportunity to uh, take that scale and that distribution on a national level, not just California. Yeah, and having someone like Mark who understands the capital markets up here, you know, he came from GMP background in banking yeah. and and understands this is really the, the, the reason that a lot of companies are able to list on the CSE is because of Origin House's early success yes. in this. So, you know, I think a lot of us owe a lot of credit to those pioneering uh, capital market drivers who've put us in the position to be successful. So now when we go out and talk to, to people and industry leaders and and investors, having somebody who has that uh, significant experience as it relates to, to being a good steward of capital for your investors, uh, he's an awesome resource to add to our executive team and our board. That's one thing about talking with um, leaders like yourself. Um, this whole industry is working together, uh, you know, for the most part. Everyone wants everybody else to succeed and everyone is trying to help and push one another. And it's a, it's just a different vibe than any other sector I've ever um, interviewed or been a part of. Um, we coined it as co -opetition. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Um, let's, let's shift gears a little bit to the Farm Bill and the States Act. So I guess you got listed in around the same time that the Farm Bill um, came through in December. How, is that, how has that affected you? How will it affect you? How will it affect your, your plans going forward? And then we can talk a little bit about the States Act. Uh, so I'll take the Farm Bill. Um, you know, as, as it relates to the core business of Cresco Labs, really didn't, uh, it doesn't touch on it, right? It's, right. it's dealing with hemp-derived CBD, which um, for the most part, we're licensed and we operate in the, in the um, state-regulated THC cannabis markets. That said, um, what this is sort of changing landscape in that CBD, for spe specifically with regard to hemp-derived CBD, has created for us as an opportunity to um, reach a consumer base mm -hmm. that either doesn't live in a state that has a legal cannabis program yet or isn't comfortable with the idea of THC as a cannabinoid based product but is willing to try CBD as a first cannabinoid based product for them or if they're still that you know comfortable there even if they do live in states that have um, licensed dispensaries maybe they don't want to go into a dispensary um, they'd like to try something that's available in CVS Walgreens and Whole Foods right. so then we started looking at it again from the perspective of a very um, brand focused uh, organization and consumer products focused organization and realize that this opportunity not only to create a, a CBD based uh, brand called Well Beings is the brand that we're creating, um, but to also bring our portfolio, our house of brands um, that are appropriate, like a Cresco, like a Remedy and like Mindy's and do hemp derived CBD versions of them. And now we can get our house of brands, the majority of the brands in our house, we can get them in front of those consumers 
today as opposed to when their laws change or when Cresco actually becomes an operator in those states. We can get that mind share today, which is pretty incredible. If you consider, you know, I think Cowan estimates this is going to be an $80 billion industry by 2030. Right. I think we're about a 12, 11 or $12 billion industry now. That next $68 billion worth of consumer, um, that's not from current customers consuming no. more. That's mm -hmm. from a new consumer base coming in. And this gives us a nice cross-channel opportunity to introduce ourselves to them today. You spoke uh, yesterday about that middle segment. So you have the, on on one side, there is uh, people using it, uh, patients, strictly medical. And then on the other side, there's strictly recreational. And then there's that 80 85 percent chunk in the middle where it's a it's a blend um did you want to comment on the states act and sure yeah and i'd also mention the safe act you know the what what the farm bill did and what the the last uh election cycle did was uh gave this opportunity for these bills to start to get called to the floor so now you're seeing bills come up in the house where the opportunity for these um, representatives to actually vote on something. The bills weren't getting called. They've been there. There's been 50 bills floating around in Congress for quite some time, but they never made it to the House floor. So now to see a bill like the SAFE Act go through the House committee, which would give access to additional banking opportunities, mm -hmm. traditional banking. We've always been able to navigate banking, and we've got 20 banking relationships, but to be able to start working with multinational banks to participate in the SAFE Act gives some additional layers of protection. Um, it's seems like that bill will navigate through and get passed. Then you have the Safe uh, the States Act, which again will codify the current situation where it gives the states the rights to operate the way that they have. They can either participate in a cannabis program, participate in a medical program, a recreational program, or choose not to, but it gives those states that empowerment and it really makes it that federal authority to push it on to the states to say, we're okay with it, you guys choose your own destiny. It seems like that bill has a lot of legs, an opportunity to pass. It's certainly, D.C. is a very unique place with a lot of different dynamics that, that dictate future outcomes. But on face value, it does seem that it has the support. It's just a matter of working through that snake in D.C. and, and seeing what comes out as a finished product. But I think what, what we feel is whether that bill gets done in 2019, or 2020, it's a foregone conclusion that it does get done before the next presidential election in the United States. Well, this launches perfectly into the uh, to the next point. The <coughs> Cannabis Legalization Subcommittee of Illinois, um, Governor-elect uh, J.B. Pritzker, um, has selected you to be on it. Yeah, that was that was a very cool honor to receive. Um, you know, I, I think that's a it's a culmination of of making sure that over the years we've been um, responsible stewards of regulated cannabis and and good operators. And you know, one of our sort of fundamental beliefs is that it's it's program and patient or program and customer first in, in all respects. And only if that program is successful can we be a successful operator within it. And so the prioritization of of making sure that any modifications, right? You, you, you want to be sitting at that table with the people holding the pen as they're thinking about how um, a, a cannabis program in your state is going to evolve or mature or otherwise change. And uh, it was an honor to, to be asked uh, by a uh, governor-elect at the time to be part of his transition committee and really represent the industry in these discussions. And, and really it was focused on on uh, restorative justice and uh, safety in communities. So it's the social equity component of when a state starts, uh, goes from a, a medical uh, law and starts discussing adult use, you can't have that conversation without addressing the social equity, social justice issues um, and that sort of trailing legacy of the war on drugs, specifically with, with regard to cannabis. And you know that was a, a priority of ours that we really started focusing on as we started to look at states or be involved in states that were starting to uh, talk about adult use about a year ago. And so we wanted to be a leader in that space. We wanted to think progressively about it. And so you know we were able to, to participate in that committee and not only bring the perspective of an operator but also, you know, recommend and suggest and launch some initiatives that are going to ensure that that bill is structured in the way that, uh, you know, that address the two primary focuses that the governor had in, in, in wanting to pass an adult use law in Illinois, which is social equity and social justice and also revenue generation. Both of those have to be a proper mix uh, to make sure that the legislation gets passed. 
the social equity component, um, at least from my perspective, has really um, leapt forward in 2019, which I think is just reflective of where the industry is headed as it matures, as it grows, as it um, as it acts responsible. Um, it's it's such a good thing all around. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think some of the states that you know, New York hit a roadblock because they didn't address some of that early enough. So I think the states that address those topics head on and put a plan together will ultimately lead to successful transitions from medical programs to adult use programs. One thing we've definitely learned about this industry is it, it is so um, sort of malleable right now, right? It's, it's at its infancy stages. This can be developed however it needs to be developed, and I've never seen an industry before that can create so many win-win-win scenarios, as opposed to, I think, most of the things that get batted around at the at the state house or the legislature, where you have to have a winner and a loser. That's not the case with cannabis. Cannabis can be developed, cannabis laws can be developed in a way that really addresses all of the priorities of the stakeholders involved. It's an incredibly unique subject matter. It's fascinating. Well, um, my last question has to do with this term that was literally made up on the spot um, called the Darwin button. And uh, for your competitors, peers, um, what do you see the Darwin button being for uh, for the next two, three, five years? Um, yeah. So I would start with, you know, this, this industry is built on regulation. Generation two of cannabis is about regulation and working with regulators. Regulators don't like getting embarrassed. They want you to be transparent with them. They want you to be upfront. They want you to work with them to develop a better program for them, for the patients, for the, cu the customers, for the, the tax basis of the state. So working with regulators, if you try to circumvent regulators, I think you run into some, some issues. Um, I think that's something that can change the dynamic of the landscape quicker than almost anything. Thing. Uh, and you had you had mentioned it uh, a little bit earlier. The you know making sure that you develop meaningful positions in the markets that you're in. I think it's going to be important for um, our peers and anybody else who's looking to establish an, a national footprint. Um, you know, it's it's more than just planting the flag. Um, right. You need to be a participant in each one of those markets that you're in because uh, one, expectations are going to be there that you do create a meaningful position and two, you, you want to be sitting at the table as these states start talking about how that program is going to be modified going forward. The worst thing I could think of is, is having a wonderful medical program that exists that you participate in tacitly and then a modification gets made to it that doesn't address what you would like to see addressed in that in that state so um, being a participant having a meaningful impact on the markets that you're in I think everybody needs to strive to do that whether that's one state two states 12 states or more mm -hmm. um, you know really being a, a, a material participant in each one of these markets well, thank you very much for your time. Um, this is your host, Barrington Miller, and this has been another episode of Hashtag Finance with Cresco Labs. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks Barrington. For Thanks for having us. Hi, it's Grace from the CSC reminding you to make sure to follow us on social media for the latest updates on our listed companies as well as new listing alerts. For more in-depth content, be sure to pick up our free quarterly magazine, Public Entrepreneur, available online at thecsc.com. Thank you.